So welcome to our audience here in New York. Welcome to our audience in Los Angeles. And to everyone watching this live stream on Yahoo, welcome to you at home as well. Uh, from the Directors Guild of America Theater here in New York. My name is Eugene Hernandez, as I said, from the Film Society of Lincoln Center. Please join me in welcoming the cast and crew from <laughs> Into the Woods. Not sitting in, now we're sitting, the lady in the back. Anna, you've obviously sung roles on both, both on stage and in movies. Um, can you walk us through the differences in performing for the big screen versus the theater? The challenge is always about um, if you're not going to sing live, if you are going to sing live, and um, you know, in this case, trying to find a, a balance that made sense for this movie of um, if I'm going to be running up and down the steps of the palace in a Colleen Atwood corset, um, <laughs> it's going to have to be, you know, some of it's going to have to be pre-recorded, otherwise it's going to be real breathy. <laughs> and um, and uh, in cases like that, it made sense because it you know, Rob and I could kind of find the performance and craft the performance in the studio and make the decision of the emotional journey that she takes in the song, whereas something like He's a Very Nice Prince with Emily, um, you know, we're sitting on a rock having a conversation and there was so much to discover that it didn't make sense to do it in the recording studio yeah. and, it, you know, we would have been locked into these performances and had no freedom to really look at each other and, and you know, uh, be challenged by each other in that scene and, and really go, no, I'm trying to make you understand and I'm trying to make you understand. Um, so, um, you know, we had, uh, we were lucky enough to get to do both in, in whatever situation made sense for, um, for that scene. Did you know some of these songs already? Uh, were some of them very familiar? Well, that's familiar? the thing about Sondheim. Mean, you think you know. Right. You think you know. You're like, yeah, 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 I know that song. Did you have to unlearn and then, um, relearn? Uh, and then Paul Gemignani plunks it out for you on uh, piano, and you take a big gulp, and you sit down in front of your sheet music and your tape recorder, and you just torture yourself. And it's great. <laughs> I understand that you discovered this musical through this screen adaptation, Chris. Um, surely you know the essential stories of Cinderella, right, and Jack and the Beanstalk, but I'm curious to know um, what you responded to in this screenplay and, and how, it makes, um, how it makes these fairy tales that we all knew as kids, how it makes them so much more complex. The most resonant thing to it, you know, we, I've heard a lot that in high schools they only perform the first act of the play, or oftentimes just the first act of the play, when things are nice and cozy and kind of what we know. And because in the second act, so much destruction and mayhem and and life happens, you know, as as much of what we know life to be. And I thought how interesting that you know, and especially in Western cultures, things like death and and pain and sorrow and all these things that we consider to be ugly and that we don't want to look at or verboten or kind of pushed aside, yet they are a part of the cycle of life, you know? And I think that there's a beautiful thing, there's a, something beautiful about incorporating that into the story that we tell each other, that these things do happen, and to invite children into what it means to be an adult human being or just to be a human being, which is there is much joy and there's much laughter, but there's also much pain and much sorrow, but there will always be hope. There's always the, the choice to, you can always choose to hope. And I think that there's something beautiful about that. And as for my character, <clears throat> I loved, just loved his two-dimensionality. <laughs> his, um, his just utter fascination with himself. <clears throat> and I told Rob I would, <laughs> I probably would have done, I mean, I would have done, just the opportunity to work with everybody is so fantastic, but there's a moment uh, before Agony when we're, me and um, Leather Pants are walking through the, <laughs> the, uh, the woods and we get to the, we get to the stream and Billy says, uh, well, no maiden would run from us. And I think, well, yet one has. And there's a camera somewhere far off to my left and the, the, the prince looks at the camera. And I'm like, I just love the idea that he knows that somewhere out there, <laughs> someone is watching him. <laughs> So for all these wonderful people doing all these complex and really kind of um, in-depth psychological studies, my character is not that. <laughs> but there is that wonderful moment at the end where Cinderella kind of uh, forces him to look at himself and to look at the effect that he may be having on other people that he 
is hurting people by what this determined drive to love all things at once. And uh, she gets him to feel this very two-dimensional character taken from the pages of the storybook. And, uh, I like that. Into the Woods explores the complexity of our own wishes and dreams, um, perhaps no more clearly seen than in the story of this woman who yearns to be a mom. Um, what she'll do to become one, and then what happens in the wake of her suddenly getting that wish. Uh, I wonder if you might reflect on that a little bit. I think maybe out of all of the characters, in a way, the baker's wife is morally the most questionable. Um, and you sort of understand it because she is desperate, you know, just desperate to be a mother. And it's, she's worked herself into a complete frenzy and distraction that she cannot put one foot in front of the other until she becomes a mother. It's just that inability to see anything else other than the desire to be a mother. Um, and she screws over all these poor fairy tale characters, <laughs> you know. And um, she takes and takes and takes and does it with humor and, and um, but she's very deliberate and is definitely the one who is uh, prepared to go to any length out of the couple. She's the one who's prepared to go to any length in order to get what she wants. Um, and she does that. And then I think what happens in the second act when she becomes a mother, which is so joyful and amazing, is that she has to suffer the ramifications of the morally questionable things that she's done. And ultimately, you know, the dalliance with the prince and all of that is however exciting, you know. And that song, Moments in the Woods, is a song of great conflict. That's the only bit of the film which I think is unbelievable. Yeah. <laughs> You know, like, and I had this with, I had this with Rob, and I, you know, like, I think, and I said to him, I think people will believe giants and witches, <laughs> beanstalks, Johnny Depp's a wolf. <laughs> no one, and, and you back me up, no one, no one leaves this. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's actually the tragedy of the character at the end is that yeah. once she's had this fling with the prince and is in great conflict about it and is debating what she did and she shouldn't have done it but it was kind of amazing but oh my god I shouldn't have done it and she realizes too late and that's the tragedy and I think a lot of people can relate to that that regretful feeling that life offers you sometimes. Share with us a little bit of the experience of shooting this uh, movie. Tell us something about shooting on the set. Share a bit, a bit of an experience. I, I can oh, man. Uh, give you a chance to embarrass uh, yourself or one of your fellow uh, well, performers. I mean... And tell us about working with the kids, actually, as well, too. Before you know it, you're in a room just talking to Meryl Streep like this is something that you do. <laughs> <laughs> and then she's amazing, and she sort of knows how you feel when you come in, when she walks in a room and she does everything she can to go, we're a company, and she led this company from the front, and there is nothing you can say about her that, that hasn't been said as a performer, as, a, as an actor, it's incredible, but as a person, to, to meet someone who takes the work so seriously, is meticulous about the work, reading it, rereading it, doing it, is so serious about it as a piece, and yet takes herself not seriously one bit. <laughs> makes the whole experience so much fun. What was the funniest or most memorable <laughs> moment on set, other than working with this guy? Day two, we were rehearsing in this mock-up bakery, uh, the witch's entrance into the bakery and the witch's wrap. And, um, and Meryl's <laughs> doing this thing, she's got this dress, she's got this rehearsal dress on, and a he's like a star, like a big walking stick thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and we're just playing around with it, and she's doing, you know, the green screen, and she's jumping all That's over. That's offensive. She's like, I'm sorry. She's, <laughs> she's, she's leaping on stuff and jumping up on things and coming up and getting in your face and all sorts of this. And, um, and she leaps up onto the table. Day two, 11 a.m. <laughs> leaps, vaults, if you will, onto this table, catches her shoe in the dress, and starts to fall back, head, the table's this high, fall back head first towards this stone floor, <laughs> and time slowed down, and I thought, I'm about to watch Meryl Streep die. <laughs> <laughs> it's happening, 
<laughs> I wish I could say I didn't consider my own career in this and think this film's going to go down. <laughs> Rob Marshall freezes and is going, oh my God, Meryl Streep's going to die. <laughs> the person who stepped in and saved her life that day was the, not the two men in the room, was the pregnant woman. <laughs> <laughs> Leaps forward, catches Meryl Streep. Me and Rob are just like, <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> and um, and I and I yeah I, I never I never forgot it really and I, and I would and every day I would look and think is she gonna is she gonna really keep going for it at this level and she really did. Yeah. <laughs> Most times, I think you only enjoy stuff on reflection. Right. You look back and go, God, we really had a great time there. I didn't realise. And every day, every single day on this, I thought, I, I don't want this to end. And I know that this, is, this has enriched me as a person, as a, as a performer. And it was the single greatest time I've ever had on a film set. Among the strongest themes of Into the Woods, is this relationship between parents and children. Um, how do you think kids will respond to Into the Woods? I think children of all ages, as they used to say, will respond to this. Because it's, it's deep and joyful and scary and funny, thanks to Chris. And, <laughs> and his chest. <laughs> and his hair. Really. <laughs> the world is dark and full of joy, both. And they know that. They know that from the time they're very little. Um, I was thinking about my son who used to draw M monsters all the time, and I think, why doesn't he draw the lake and the, the <laughs> island? It's so beautiful out there, and my garden, you know. And he was always drawing things that were terrifying because they have to get ready. They have to get ready in them in themselves. They know they have to be ready for the bad stuff, the big stuff. Stuff's going to come. The role of the quote-unquote wicked stepmother is certainly such an iconic character type in stories, right? Um, so I'm wondering what your take on this role uh, of James Lapine and Stephen Sondheim's stepmother, and, and what did you aim to bring to it, having knowledge of how it looked and felt in the theater, and, and being asked to inhabit this character? The energy of those characters, particularly the mother, is in you know, um, status and money and image, and in that regard, I think it's very contemporary sensibility, <laughs> the worst of our contemporary sensibility. Could you please talk about the idea of what a fairy tale means to you and, and maybe explain this sort of uh, relevance importance today as you see it? I do feel this is very much a, a fairy tale for the post 9-11 generation. Um, I have to say, and I don't think I ever shared this with you, but um, I was, um, it was 2011, I was listening to President Obama speak to the families of the victims on the 10th anniversary of 9-11. And um, it, it was incredibly moving, and uh, he was in incredibly compassionate. And he said to the families, he said, um, you are not alone. No one is alone. He said those words. And I remember hearing that, and, and I thought, it's such an important message for today. And it's obviously sort of the main, to me, the main song in the piece in Into the Woods. And I felt this might be the time for kids of today, families of today, to be able to hear that there is some hope in the world. And um, it was then that I called you mm. and said, you know, could we do this? Because I felt like, and I still feel, that you know, kids today live in a much more unstable and fragile world than when I certainly grew up. And I feel like um, there needs to be something to hold on to, something um, for them to understand that it's okay when something happens disappointing, some loss. I mean, this, this movie has so many themes that's so beautiful about it. I don't think you set out to do that originally, James, sort of thematically one theme. But the theme of loss and how you move forward is the one that really struck me. Talk about this notion of the woods, how you interpret this idea of the woods. 
Um, how did you think about it and how did you talk about it with James? Well, the woods is so many things. It's the place you go into to learn, to get your wish, to grow, to change. Um, it's fearful, it's seductive, it's all of those things, and it's life, you know. So you, you, you go in and you learn and come out again a different person, and every character goes into the woods to get something. I love the desperation that everybody has and needs something so badly. And then once they have that, it's, is it what they wanted? Cinderella's mother in the tree says that beautiful thing, are you certain what you wish is what you want? And um, it, you think it is, but with Cinderella, for instance, she realizes maybe it's not where she's comfortable and where she should be. So it's, um, you know, it, it really explores the woods as all of those things that you, it, and it's a, it's a metaphor for life, really. I'm curious, uh, how far into the process were you trying to make the decision of, okay, this is where we want to uh, go with something practical, have them on location, have them singing and dancing in the middle of a river versus uh, <laughs> let's put it in a blue screen and we'll decide that later on in the computer? I think it's very important in this piece that you really care about these people. I mean, what I loved about these extraordinary actors is that they brought them to life with such vulnerability and, and strength and, and, and joy and, and, and fear and all of it, very human. And, you know, when I think of Meryl's Witch, for instance, it's, it's, it's so dimensional in a way that I've never seen before, so vulnerable. You care so much for the witch. So that's important. And, and that reality and that be able to t being able to touch that was important for me too. And, I, and so to do that in a, a blue room or a green room, you know, um, I, I don't think we would have found our world. Take a moment and tell us from your vantage point as the co-creator of what we've just seen, the originator, um, why do you feel that Into the Woods remains so resonant to audiences today? What do you think it is about it that, that connects with people today? First of all, fairy tales have been around for a while and will continue to be so. And um, I think um, it's funny how, uh, you know, I won't bore you with all the details how we came up with this notion, but I remember um, I was about to be a father and uh, my wife was expecting and um, I was a little nervous to say the least. And um, we had just sort of hit on this idea and I remember I was working on a show and. Uh, I was in the theater with a designer who had a little two-year-old who she was trying to feed and the kid was like throwing Cheerios and food all over the place and I'm going, oh my God, this is what I have to look forward to. And I said, are you gonna teach your daughter uh, table manners, you know? <laughs> and she turned to me and she said, James, all I hope to do in life is teach my daughter the difference between right and wrong. And it was such a resonant little moment uh, that it kind of fed our, our whole sort of thematic uh, propulsion with, with the, the writing of the show. And I think it's, I don't think we would have guessed it would be, continue to be this popular, but I think it just resonates because uh, people are always having children and our children are growing up and we're leaving them a world that uh, often, more times than not, worries us a lot. And um, we, own, we own that, you know. Uh, once we get older, we have to look back and go, we're on the other side now, can't blame our parents. You know, our kids are blaming us. So uh, <laughs> that was kind of uh, the sort of thematic germ of it all. I was wondering if you could talk about uh, the process of deciding which songs to cut and how you made those choices and how painful was it? Rob and I worked really hard to capture the essence of the show without ever being literal to it. And um, I think we both had to come down to the hard choices, what should stay and what shouldn't. And Stephen Sondheim couldn't have been more supportive of the decisions. There's one person who's, uh, who's missing from this stage. Uh, but he won't be missing for long because um, he sent a note. Yes, yeah, Steve. S Steve Sondheim is, uh, sent a note. He said, I'm, I'm sorry not to be there with all of you to celebrate Into the Woods, but I've been laid low by a virus. However, James Lapine, my good friend and collaborator for 30 years, with whom I wrote the show, is present to help convey the pride we feel in the movie that the Disney studio has made of it. Stage and screen are such a totally different medium. The Disney film of Into the Woods is a happy exception, partly because so many of the cast come from the stage. This is true. 
and understand the differences between the two mediums. And partly because Rob Marshall, the director, is an accomplished and imaginative practitioner of both. Another reason, I have to add blushingly, is that James and I were closely involved in the making of the movie all along the way, from conception to refinement. It was an exhilarating and exciting experience, which I think is reflected in the final result. I hope you'll agree. That's from Steve. Wow.